All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. We're moving on to chapter three today, and the beginning of this chapter is a little technical, and I've struggled to know how much to go into it. Um, I'm going to talk a lot at the beginning about solvents, solubility, and some principles related to that. Your text spends a section talking about something called chemical potential. It's sort of a review from PCHEM, and um, we, we may go through it, but in the end it just gets to deriving the equilibrium constant, which I think you sort of all know. So uh, I'm not sure how much we'll do. What I'm really excited to get to is non-covalent interactions, because that has a lot to do with um, organic chemistry and with biology and with materials chemistry, lots of interesting applications. Um, so it may be useful at the beginning to sort of think about what is a liquid versus a solid or a gas. A gas is characterized by complete randomness, uh, whereas liquids and solids are, are, uh, have increasing amounts of uh, order. So if you think about uh, individual molecules in a crystal, and we're going to define a radial distribution function. It has, I don't know why it has G. The R there means it's, the, uh, it's a function of radius. This is going to be the probability of finding another molecule at a certain distance R from our molecule reference point. All right, and let's see, we'll make this our y-axis, and here will be r. I made it way too long. I want that to be shorter than that, okay. Um, and this is about the 50, where, where our x-axis intersects the y-axis is about the 50% probability, all right? So, um, just because of the size of molecules, there's sort of this uh, exclusion zone. It's, and it's actually sometimes called excluded volume where other molecules can't be because of electron-electron repulsion and poly exclusion and so on. But beyond a certain point, you encounter a first shell of surrounding uh, molecules. And in the crystal, you know, that probability drops and then it goes up again and it drops and it goes up again because after each increment R, you're getting another molecule. And this is called long range order. Uh, and you can Google any number of crystals from sodium chloride to various protein crystals and they're all characterized by long range order, repeating units of structure. Uh, in contrast, liquids uh, have what's called short-range order, and there is some organization of molecules in the liquid, um, but uh, it's not as ordered as, uh, as the solid. Liquids are held together by enthalpically favorable interactions, um, yeah, so if we do the same graph, let me just sort of copy and paste. I know that's horrible. Um, and for the liquid, the first sort of, our first encounter with nearby molecules is going to look similar. But at that point, uh, where the next few molecules are as we get further and further from our molecule reference point, uh, where those next molecules are becomes more and more random. So, and remember the 50% 50, 50 probability line is sort of our random point. It's the odds of finding a molecule at that particular distance from another molecule, well, flip a coin. So, within a certain number of angstroms of our molecule, there's a fairly high probability of finding uh, a, a uh, molecule in our liquid. We might call this the first solvent shell. And if, uh, if we're in water, this would be like the, the uh, first set of water molecules that are surrounding our molecule reference point. Um, and then as you get out to the second solvent shell, it's 
slightly less probability because things are more fluid out there and third solvent shell and eventually you get to sort of randomness all right so um it's good to remember this sort of short range order of liquids we don't want to think of liquids as completely random but we want to think of the order as being uh short range now we're going to talk about the uh, interactions that hold liquids together but uh, before we do that we're just going to consider the influence of a solvent a liquid on um, non-covalent on let's see the strength of various interactions and also on solubility so um, if you've spent any time at all in an organic lab, you've had to think about solvent polarity. Mostly because you're thinking about how do I get this molecule that I want to dissolve. Uh, but before we talk about solubility, it turns out that the strength of interactions in a solvent is going to depend on the polarity of that solvent. And the relationship there is defined by Coulomb's law, where the energy of interaction between two charges is equal to the product of those two charges. And then we've got some constants in the denominator, and R is the distance between those two charges. All right? Um, so this is the potential energy. And we saw this before when we were deriving the Hamiltonian for, uh, for an atom. But it applies to point charges uh, as well. This epsilon is, I'm not sure, if, yeah, that's the Greek letter epsilon with the uh, subscript zero is called the permittivity of a vacuum. And I don't care about the units. Basically, this describes how empty space responds to an electric field, all right? Um, and then the regular epsilon is called the dielectric constant. And uh, this uh, epsilon is equal to the permittivity of a particular medium, which your book, don't you don't have to write this down, it's kind of dumb, which your book calls E with the subscript Greek letter mu, divided by the permittivity of the vacuum. So this is the ratio of, the dielectric constant is the ratio of the permittivity of uh, some medium between the two charges to the permittivity of a vacuum. So if epsilon is greater than one, that means your medium, whatever it is between the charges, responds more to an electric field than does a vacuum. All right. Um, the term dielectric constant is uh, came from the fact that this is measured in a uh, capacitance experiment where you take two charged plates and you put something between them and you charge the plates up and you measure the capacitance you can get there and the dielectric constant, uh, if it's high, it will shield the two plates from each other and they won't feel each other as much. All right, so um, molecules or solvents, and this is an important thing that I don't think I've really grasped until fairly recently, solvents with high dielectric constants uh, can better screen charges from each other. And uh, this follows uh, by simply looking at Coulomb's law, our dielectric constant, let's see, the one we wanna talk about, the dielectric constant shows up in the denominator. So larger values for dielectric constant should decrease the potential energy between two charges or decrease the strength of the interaction. So how, do you, how can you have a, a high dielectric constant? Well, let's actually look at a table and see what characterizes dielectric constants. Hmm. There it is. Um, whoops. 
I guess we don't need to make that bigger. I guess we can just zoom in. So, oops, dielectric constant. Dang it. Random letters showing up in strange places. Okay. Uh, dielectric constant is listed for various solvents here, epsilon. These other terms don't worry about for now. We'll talk about them a little bit later. Um, you can see that at the bottom, hexane is, uh, responds twice as much to an electric field as does a vacuum. Uh, but we consider hexane to be a nonpolar solvent. So hydrocarbons are not quite a vacuum. They're a little bit better than a vacuum, but not much. Uh, and you start to go from hexane to carbon tetrachloride, benzene, also very nonpolar. Then you have solvents of intermediate polarity, T-butyl alcohol, ethanol. Uh, water's up here at 78, and it turns out that for mamid, which is, uh, yeah, is even, it even has a higher dielectric constant than water. All right, so you would expect electrostatic interactions to be weaker in water than in less polar solvents. And that is because the water molecules will arrange themselves around the charges in such a way as to shield the charges from each other. Uh-huh. That's why you can't dissolve sodium yeah that's well yeah you would expect the energy of the interaction uh, between the two charges in hexane to be quite high uh, but it's also an issue of can once the once the solute is dissolved do the interactions that are around it compensate for the ones that you lost by breaking apart sodium chloride and the answer there is no but we'll have we'll have a bit more to say uh, about that other Questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah. Say that again. Sorry. Um, well, it turns out that solvent polarity is is kind of complicated. Um, there are a number of different factors, and so that's why they're giving you multiple polarity scales here. And it sort of depends on what you want. Um, for example, if you're trying to dissolve something that has a lot of hydrogen bond donors, then you want something that can be a good hydrogen bond acceptor. Um, and some solvents are good at one, but not as good at the other. So, for example, alpha is a scale based on um, your something's ability to be a hydrogen bond donor, whereas beta is related to something that can be a hydrogen bond acceptor. And these are derived from specific experiments that your book goes into, but we don't need to. One interesting molecule from this perspective is DMSO, um, dimethyl sulfoxide. You can draw like that, though you can draw a resonant structure with a double bond, but it's got a dipole. It's fairly polar, but it doesn't have any electro uh, bonds between hydrogen and an electro and electronegative atoms. So this is not a good H bond donor, and that's reflected by the fact that its alpha number is zero. Um, in contrast. Uh, it's a decent hydrogen bond acceptor because it's got this negatively charged oxygen. And uh, we'll see a little bit later that hydrogen bond don uh, acceptors are also, by virtue of the fact that they've got atoms with substantial partial negative charge on them, uh, these are molecules that can coordinate and stabilize cations. So DMSO readily surrounds and solvates sodium ions. Um, however, you would predict, based on the fact that it has no hydrogen bond donors, it ought to be pretty, pretty, pretty cruddy at solvating anions, right? And um, 
that will have consequences later on when we want to have anions that are unsolvated and uns uh, are not solvated well and are therefore more reactive we'll use DMSO as a solvent so like in the SN2 reaction it'd be great uh, for us to be able to take sodium iodide and pull the sodium away from the iodide and now the iodide can be a nucleophile all right what else Okay, so that is a solvent polarity scale. There are a couple other uh, observations about uh, liquids uh, that can give you a sense for the strength of the interactions between individual liquid molecules. And understanding that is an important precursor to understanding whether something's going to be soluble in a particular solvent. So one of these features is called heat of vaporization. That's how much heat do you have to put in or energy do you have to put in in order to take something from uh, the liquid phase to the gas phase, completely overcoming the interactions and getting to a random state. So here's a table from your text that shows that. And as expected, water, which sort of tops our polarity list uh, in terms of dielectric constant, also has a really high heat of vaporization. We're not going to talk about what this delta parameter on the right is, though your text mentions it. Um, and, and notice that um, heat of vaporization uh, is higher for water than it is uh, for methanol. Um, and these, you can think of these as somewhat related to, uh, to measured boiling points, but, uh, but not exactly. Um, so you would conclude, okay, the intermolecular interactions that are holding water together are um, stronger than the ones that are holding, say, benzene together as a liquid. Um, another maybe more esoteric but still kind of interesting measure of the strength of interactions between solvent molecules is the solvent's surface tension which is officially uh, defined it's given the greek letter gamma because we can't think of any other greek letters to use we're just going to repeat using greek letters uh, is equal to the uh, a small amount of work that is required to change the surface area of a solvent by a small amount, okay? So it's how much energy do you have to put in per change, per square meter, square centimeter, square angstrom, whatever, change in surface area of a solvent. Um, and as you know, water has a decently mm -hmm. high surface tension. This is why um, some bugs can walk on water um, and why uh, but in any case, uh, you can see based on surface tension, again, waters is high. Mercury's is crazy high, too. <laughs> um, and surface tension is related to how readily a solvent will spread out on a surface. You also have to factor in um, the interactions between that solvent and the surface. Uh, but if you've ever seen mercury beat up and roll around, it has an extremely high surface tension. The, the interactions between mercury atoms uh, are strong relative to the potential interactions between mercury and the various surfaces. Go ahead. Similarly, if you've ever tried to put water through a chromatography column or small pipette, you'll notice that compared to the other organic solvents, it's very thick and smooth. Can you talk about that? Okay, if you try to put water through a through like silica? Yeah, or through small, small orifices. Okay, yeah. Um, so actually this is, um, this is, this has an important application for those of you who do HPLC. And, and it also has to do with something called viscosity, which itself is related to intermolecular interactions. But in my lab, we do a lot of HPLC to purify peptides. And the solvents we use are water and acetonitrile. And the mixture of water and acetonitrile, putting acetonitrile in dramatically decreases the viscosity of water, and we're able to uh, pump uh, solvent through our columns at, at decently high pressures. 
sometimes though, uh, when I was in, in my postdoc, the world had a shortage of acetonitrile. It was related to, they think, the economic slowdown that happened with the 2007 financial crisis and the fact that with the 2008 Olympics in Beijing that uh, a lot of Chinese companies slowed down production to decrease the amount of pollution and acetonitrile is actually made as a byproduct of plastic synthesis. Um, so all of a sudden acetonitrile wasn't available and we had to use methanol instead of acetonitrile and methanol has higher surface tension, more viscous and was more difficult to push through the columns and the chromatography decreased in in goodness, but we survived. Um, that's kind of a young whippersnapper. When I was your age, I had to walk to school in the snow, barefoot, uphill both ways, and so on. But for those of you who are doing HPLC, be grateful that you can use acetonitrile. Um, all right, so what makes water... Um, so polar, uh, people have called water a special solvent, and your text makes the argument that water is not special, it's just way on the high end of polarity. It's at the extreme of the types of solvents that we can use. Of course, water has a large molecular dipole. Uh, it's also got um, two hydrogen bond donors and two lone pairs that can be hydrogen bond acceptors. Water can arrange itself in a uh, tetrahedral sort of geometry where it can interact with uh, four other water molecules. And of course in ice, that's what you see, each water molecule is involved in four hydrogen bonds. Uh, it turns out in liquid water each water molecule on average at zero degrees Celsius in liquid water, each water molecule has about 3.4 hydrogen bonds, meaning that uh, contrary to what you might have thought about what, what it means when something melts, you only lose around 15% of hydrogen bonds uh, on melting from ice uh, to liquid water. So liquid water is still highly, uh, heavily hydrogen bound. And uh, as our radial distribution function might uh, tell us, in the immediate vicinity of any given water molecule, you've actually got a fair amount of short range order. So um, people have described water as involving ice-like clusters that uh, interchange rapidly. So uh, they call this uh, a flickering cluster because um, the half-life of a hydrogen bond in water is on the order of 10 to the minus 10 or 10 to the 11, minus 11 seconds. Um, so I think that's tens to hun 10 to hundreds of picoseconds. Uh, that a given hydrogen bond lasts. And so, is it fair to call water flickering ice-like clusters? Oh, fantastic. Well, um, yes and no. On our time scale that we can perceive, absolutely not. But on a shorter time scale, yeah, it's like you have cluster of hydrogen bonds, cluster of hydrogen bonds, cluster of hydrogen bonds interchanging uh, rapidly. Um, all right, so let's talk about solubility. It's useful to think about solubility in a little bit more technical terms aside from, dang it, that solvent did not dissolve my product, or yes, my product went into that solvent. Um, let's talk about the steps of dissolving. Uh, first, there is cavity creation in the solvent. So the solvent has to make space for the thing that's going to dissolve, which we will call solute. Okay, got to make space. Now, what does the process of making space require? Well, 
some water molecules have to get out of the way, so that's going to involve a decrease in enthalpically favorable interactions between solvent. I guess I'm just going to call that a solvent-solvent interaction. And uh, that's also going to involve a uh, unfavorable decrease in entropy because by virtue of the fact that you've made a space where there are no solvent molecules, you have um, lowered the freedom or number of possible possible configurations or arrangements of the solvent. Okay? So that part, making the cavity, should be uphill. So that's one of the things you got to overcome. All right? Uh, second, your solute has to separate. And this doesn't necessarily happen in, in order or in these disjointed steps, but Remember, thermodynamics is state functions, so uh, all, that all that matters is the starting point and the ending point, not how we got there. Solute separates from the solid. Again, you're going to lose solute-solute interactions, so that should be unfavorable from an enthalpy point of view. Um, though you might predict that the solute on separating from the solid uh, might have greater degrees of freedom um, and therefore greater entropy. Um, okay, step three, solute occupies cavity. Um, this is funny, it occurs to me that dividing up dissolving into these steps is kind of like talking about the steps in the repentance process. <laughs> when I was young, we were taught that there were sort of three or four or five steps in the repentance process and you needed to do it in order and do it the right way or else it didn't count. Unfortunately, nowadays we are learning that repentance is a journey, that a lot of the steps happen at once and gospel learning from chemistry. Um, Let's see, so when the solute occupies the cavity, this is gonna be favorable because you can now have interactions between solute and solvent. And then you lastly, you've got something called the entropy of mixing, which is uh, way favorable. Uh, and it means that there are many, many different configurations of having a solute molecule dissolved than having a solute molecule um, in the solid. And I guess they've separated out that entropy of mixing step from step two. So these are sort of the things that you have to account for. Uh, making a cavity in the solvent and separating a solute from the solid these are things you can estimate from, uh, you can get an idea of the strength of these uh, interactions from maybe heat of vaporization or from uh, surface tension. Um, and then these are factors that are related to, entropy of mixing is fairly generic, but the solute-solvent interactions are highly related to nature of um, the solute, its structure, and the solvent. And keep in mind, in order for this process to be favorable, entropy of mixing is always going to be favorable, but your key question is, do the interactions I get, do the interactions I get compensate for and replace the interactions that I lost up here. So creating the cavity made me lose solvent-solvent interactions. Separating the solute from the solid made me lose solute-solute interactions. Austin, no? Okay. 
Uh, overall, add it all together, we call this the solvation energy. And for various solutes and various solvents, you can predict whether this is uh, downhill or not. Um, so you can tabulate solvation energies, though actually a more useful um, term is uh, free energy of transfer from some solvent to another. Uh, your text shows you a table that I'll, let's see, is this it? Yeah. Show you here about the, uh, the free energy of transfer of various solutes from uh, water or listed here, the solvents listed here, from those solvents to methanol. Um, tetraethyl ammonium iodide seems to prefer uh, water to methanol. Uh, on the other hand, t-butyl chloride prefers ethanol or methanol to water. Um, and these are fairly specific. A more generic uh, way to deal with estimating solubility is to look for what are called water octanol partition coefficients. And uh, this is highly useful uh, in lots of different areas of chemistry, particularly in drug development. So the partition coefficient is if you take a solute and you put it in water and you let it equilibrate with being in octanol, and then you measure the concentration of that solute in water versus in octanol, That is the partition coefficient. It's sort of an equilibrium constant for, and, and the, ex, the uh, classic experiment is to take a SEP funnel and uh, you've got the two phases, you've got water and octanol, and then you've got your little green molecules of choice and you shake everything up and then you measure the concentration in the aqueous phase versus in the octanol. Um, this is an equilibrium constant. If you put a logarithm in front of that, you convert that equilibrium constant or partition coefficient into something that tracks with free energy. Uh, we call this log P and uh, positive numbers for log P mean uh, preference for octanol, which is less polar, uh, and negative numbers would mean uh, preference for water. Okay, um, go ahead. How was it that they decided on octanol? I've almost ne I've never used that as a solvent. <laughs> I don't know, other than maybe water and octanol together. You needed a combination of solvents that you could get measurable concentrations in both. Because yeah, most, the most common solvent I've used for extractions is everlasting. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't know why they chose octanol. Um, the, the only reason I can think of is that they needed to have measurable concentrations in both phases. Yeah. Yes, yeah, specific to solute and solvent. That seems a little inconsistent. Yeah. Isn't that just the Yeah. <laughs> well, so, but this is reasoning through sort of all the things that have to happen. Right. So if one thing is not soluble in the other, how do you troubleshoot? And you got to think about all of these, all of these uh, factors. Um, a couple of uh, log P values for you to just sort of compare. Um, DMF has a log P of minus one, uh, meaning it prefers water. Acetone minus 0.23, I think. Uh, in contrast, toluene 2.5 uh, and octane or gasoline uh, has 4.5. So you can see the variation in log P values. 
One of the most convenient things about log P is that there's enough data tabulated that you can actually uh, use programs to calculate log P values for molecules you want to synthesize, even if it hasn't been measured. Um, so you can do this in ChemDraw. You just have to, I think, uh, tell it to show you the properties. I can't remember what box you checked, but um, look it up because if you want to, if you want to sort of see how polar your product is or nonpolar, that can be useful. Um, log P is also a part of uh, medicinal chemistry thinking. Uh, Lipinski's rule of five describes five major characteristics of molecules that are have been successful in drug development and one of them is they should have a log P of five or less. Uh, that just noticed by analyzing a lot of the molecules that are approved as drugs Lipinski, and this happened in, I think, 1997, um, observed that a lot of active and, and useful drug molecules were reasonably lipoph lipophilic, but weren't too nonpolar. Um, and there's some other, uh, other five crops up all over the place, uh, have a molecular weight of 500 or less, and they're not hard and fast rules, but there's some uh, rules that described at least what had been successful drug candidates in the 90s. Um, all right. Your book talks about diffusion um, in a very technical way, which I don't think is necessary for us, so I'm going to sort of skip it a little bit. I will show you a table of diffusion coefficients. Uh, which gives you a sense for how fast uh, a molecule will be able to move via a random walk in any of these solvents. Uh, the diffusion coefficient uh, depends on uh, the shape of the solute, uh, interactions between the solute and the solvent, interactions between solvent itself, uh, solvent viscosity, um, and if you know the diffusion coefficient d, you can calculate the rate of diffusion. And in most solvents, the rate of diffusion is 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 9 per second. Um, and reactions that have rates approaching this value are called diffusion controlled reaction rates. So that's as fast as a reaction can go in solvent because the molecules can't find each other any faster than that. Yeah? Can we raise that limit by raising the temperature? Can you raise the limit by raising the temperature? I think so, but perhaps not by not by an order of magnitude. The because the water molecules uh, molecules in a solvent are already moving very quickly. Yeah. Um, what's happening per second? Uh, it's so this is this is where we get into the technical math. You define a driving force, which is how much does the concentration change uh, if the solute moves a little bit, and then from that you calculate the flux through a square area of space, how many molecules are passing through whatever square meter or whatever of space. And then from that you can you can determine the diffusion coefficient and then calculate the rate of diffusion. So um, so yeah, that, that per second, it feels like you need a few more units. Like how far is it going per second? And I think that's, uh, I, I don't have an answer for you. I guess you can think of it as the movement of a molecule, an incremental distance in some random direction, how many times per second. Um, all right. So you'll see some enzymes that are uh, approach diffusion controlled reaction rates. They make the reactions happen uh, as fast as can possibly happen in water. A couple of interesting things to note from this table. Um, the diffusion is highly shape and size dependent. So all of these enzymes down here uh, have very low diffusion coefficients. And um, 
Austin, actually the diffusion coefficient tells you it is a meter squared per second kind of thing. So it's a, yeah, it describes passing of a molecule through this space. Um, as the enzyme gets bigger, uh, it diffuses more slowly, so serum albumin or hemoglobin, and then if, depending on the shape of the enzyme, uh, the, the protein, collagen is a long, uh, stringy uh, protein, and it diffuses very slowly in water. Um, another interesting feature is just the fact that proton diffuses, diffuses insanely fast in water, and that is not because the proton, single proton or hydronium, zips around like this. It's that the water molecules are rapidly trading who's hydrogen bonding with whom. And so as soon as you hand off the proton to one water molecule, uh, within hundreds of picoseconds later, it's the molecule over here that has the extra proton instead of that one. It's sort of called proton hopping. Uh, and that's the same reason why diffusion of hydroxide is really fast in water because of the proton swapping. You can tell it's not, sorry, Kim, uh, uh, go ahead. Losing a pro, well, so I don't, I don't know what the conditions of those experiments were. That's a good question. A situation in which you'd have a, an acidic pH and then where does that proton go is just trading the proton, which is smaller. Uh, trading around where the OH group is also involves trading around the proton. So yeah, I don't know why the numbers are different. They're certainly within an order of magnitude though. All right. So that's just sort of fun. I remember learning that, um, and it blowing my mind that when a molecule uh, went, that you can't ever find the proton again once you dump it in water, it's just sort of gone. Um, which is kind of cool. All right, I don't really want to talk about chemical potential. Is that okay? <laughs> uh, it's a review from PCHEM, and uh, we may need to revisit it in the future. I don't know how much it's going to come up, so we'll just deal with it again when we need to. Um, I want to talk now about non-covalent interactions. And we wanted to talk about solvent because the strength of these non-covalent interactions is going to be dependent on their environment. And of course, it's non-covalent interactions that hold solvent molecules together in the first place. So um, a lot of these are going to fall under the category of what we're going to call electrostatic interactions. That is, they're going to involve charges, dipoles, and even induced dipoles. And uh, there are different uh, laws and distance dependencies for charges versus dipoles versus induced dipoles. We'll start with the simplest case, which is an ion pair. Um, and this is a situation where the cation and the anion are close enough that um, they interact, the interaction between them based on Coulomb's law is too strong to be uh, separated by whatever thermal uh, energy is currently available, which you can calculate at any given temperature by multiplying the temperature in Kelvin by the gas constant. We've already seen, based on Coulomb's law, that oops, solvents with high electric dielectric constants are going to reduce the potential energy and reduce the strength of the ion pair. Um, but dielectric, dielectric constant doesn't account for other factors like the ability to hydrogen bond with cation or anion. And so if the interactions that you're going to replace the ion pair with are about as strong as the ion pair, then the ion pair may not uh, 
may not hold up. Um, a couple of other things. Um, in uh, the size and shape of the ion pair is important. Uh, because when you separate them, the solvent molecules have to move out of the way, get in between them, and that reduces substantially the degrees of freedom of the solvent molecules. The ion pair is generally smaller than the separated ions. And so, um, in particular, if you don't have favorable interactions uh, to compete with the ion pair, uh, the ion pair is going to survive. And so ion pairs are going to be common in organic solvents. And, uh, but you might expect that in water, where the dielectric constant is 78, you might expect ion pairs to not be as strong. And easier to separate. Now, in the gas phase, ion pairs can have strengths of 100 or more, more kilocalories per mole. In water, ion pairs may have strength of 1 kilocalorie per mole or less. And there's a special class of ion pairs that are near and dear to the heart of uh, the shepherd and for the protein chemist. I'm going to mess up that particular hymn, dear to the heart of the protein chemist. Um, you can laugh at me if you don't want to laugh with me. Laughing at me is always okay. The salt bridge is an interaction between, in, in proteins, uh, positively charged side chains, which are either ammonium groups or guanidinium groups with their negatively charged counterparts, which are either aspartate or glutamate side chains. And um, you might expect the strength of an interaction between charged groups in a protein would be highly dependent on first, looking at Coulomb's law, the distance between the two, so you've got the R, and then the other important factor is the dielectric constant. And because water's dielectric constant is high, you might predict that if you have a, I hate to do this, amorphous blob of a protein, and you have a positive charge and a negative charge separated by a large distance, you might expect that interaction to be very weak, if not negligible. If the two were closer together, you might expect a small interaction. And if you had a positive and a negative charge buried in the nonpolar interior of a protein, you might expect a slightly stronger uh, interaction, uh, just based on the dielectric constant argument alone. Um, so this, uh, I guess, is where we wrap up. My lab actually does a fair amount of research into the strength of salt bridges and the context dependence of how strong they are. And if it's OK, I just want to take a couple minutes at the beginning of next class to tell you a little bit about it. So that'll do for today. Have a great, what is it, Monday? Dang it. Have a great Monday. <laughs>